The idea that Earth could be a cosmic prison is not merely science fiction. It's a hypothesis that tickles the edges of philosophy, ethics, and our understanding of advanced civilizations. To fully appreciate this concept, we must question our place in the universe and examine our nature and limitations. Imagine a universe filled with civilizations so advanced that they have not only mastered space travel, but also ethical dilemmas and social structures on a cosmic scale. These civilizations could conceivably create a prison for those deemed dangerous or undesirable. Earth, in this context, could be one such prison. What would make Earth a perfect prison? Its isolation in space, the limitations of human biology and the barriers to interstellar travel could all be carefully engineered constraints. Our environment sustains us, but also contains us. Diseases, natural disasters and the vastness of space could all be mechanisms that keep us in check. The imprisonment might not just be physical. Limitations on our intellectual growth and spiritual understanding could also be part of this cosmic incarceration. This aspect of the theory suggests that our understanding of the universe is intentionally limited, keeping us from uncovering the true nature of our existence. Understanding why humans might be imprisoned requires a philosophical leap. Were we once part of an advanced civilization that fell from grace? Are we being quarantined for the protection of other beings? Or perhaps we are an experiment observed for some unknown purpose. Subtle hints or artifacts could be hidden within our planet or even within our DNA waiting to be discovered. These might be clues left by our cosmic jailers, messages or warnings to guide or control our development. The concept of the Panopticon was first brought to light by the philosopher Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th century. A Panopticon is a circular prison where inmates are under constant surveillance from a central watchtower, yet they can't see when they are being watched. This unique design was intended to control behavior through the fear of constant observation. Applying this idea to the entire universe, or our place in it, offers an intriguing lens through which to explore the notion of Earth as an alien prison. If Earth were a prison, the Panopticon model suggests that there might be constant surveillance from a cosmic standpoint. Unlike a physical watchtower, this cosmic Panopticon might employ advanced technologies or even metaphysical mechanisms that we can't comprehend. The watchful eyes of a higher civilization could be monitoring our every move, every thought, even our spiritual evolution. The most potent effect of a panopticon is the psychological control it exerts. Inmates, unsure of when they are being watched, regulate their own behavior as though they are always under observation. If we extrapolate this concept to a cosmic level, it could mean that our very thoughts, behaviors and cultural development are being shaped or limited by unseen observers. The mysteries of human consciousness and our search for meaning might be influenced by this invisible presence. A panopticon on a cosmic scale could imply not only psychological but technological control. Limitations on our scientific advancements could be deliberately engineered to keep us confined to Earth. Every time humanity approaches a breakthrough that might lead to interstellar travel or deeper understanding of the universe, unseen forces could subtly guide us away or create barriers to our progress. Who would be the watchers in this cosmic panopticon? Are they gods, aliens, or something beyond our understanding? Are they benevolent, guiding us toward enlightenment at a pace we can handle? Or are they malevolent, suppressing us for reasons we can't fathom? Subtle clues to the existence of a cosmic panopticon might exist in ancient texts, mysterious phenomena, or even within our own psychology. The universal religious themes of omniscient deities, spiritual tests and cosmic judgment may not be mere products of human imagination, but echoes of a grander truth. As we look at the history of human civilization, we can see an astounding progression of technological and social achievements. However, it's also possible to identify certain constraints or barriers that seem to hinder our advancement. Could these limitations be part of a designed system to contain humanity within a specific framework? In exploring the Earth as a prison hypothesis, we must examine these constraints and consider whether they may be deliberate manipulations by an external force. From fire to the wheel, from steam power to quantum computing, our technological advancements have been rapid and significant, yet there remain specific challenges and barriers that seem to elude us. The lack of significant progress in areas like fusion energy, faster than light travel, or even fully understanding our own brains raises questions. 
Are we hitting our natural limits? Or is there a force preventing us from making these groundbreaking discoveries? Historically, we've seen the rise and fall of empires, revolutions and reforms, yet many of the fundamental structures and inequalities persist. Despite our advancements in philosophy, politics and social sciences, we continue to grapple with recurring issues like poverty, war and injustice. Could these recurring patterns be engineered to maintain a status quo, keeping us occupied with earthly matters and preventing us from looking beyond our planet? Our dependence on Earth's natural resources binds us to this planet. We rely on fossil fuels, minerals, water and the delicate balance of our ecosystem. Even our most advanced space technologies are limited by these earthly dependencies. Is this a natural result of evolution or could it be a designed constraint to keep us tethered to Earth? Our own minds might be our greatest constraint. Fear of the unknown, skepticism towards new ideas, conflicts between science and faith. All these psychological factors can limit our pursuit of knowledge and understanding. This mental confinement might be a deliberate aspect of our supposed prison ensuring we don't break free from our established paradigms. If these constraints are indeed part of a grand design, who or what is responsible? Alien overseers with advanced technologies could subtly manipulate our progress. Alternatively, cosmic laws or forces beyond our understanding might naturally enforce these limitations. The idea that Earth might be a prison for humanity isn't a purely modern concept. Throughout history, various myths, legends and religious texts have alluded to ideas that resonate with this hypothesis. These ancient narratives, spread across different cultures and epochs, might hold hidden clues that lend credence to the theory that our world is a containment facility overseen by otherworldly beings. In ancient Sumerian texts, the Anunnaki were a group of deities who were said to have created and controlled humanity. Some interpretations of these texts suggest that the Anunnaki might have used humans for labor, creating a system that restricted human freedom and kept them confined to specific roles and locations. Greek mythology tells the tale of Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods to give to humanity. His punishment, being chained to a rock, could be seen as a symbolic representation of humanity's confinement to Earth, restricted by greater cosmic forces. In Hindu mythology, Lord Shiva performs the cosmic dance that controls the universe's destruction and creation. This cyclical nature of existence, where destruction leads to rebirth, might symbolize the perpetual constraints that keep humanity confined within specific bounds, unable to escape a predefined cycle. Many Native American tribes speak of Spider Woman who wove the web of existence. This web could be seen as a metaphor for the interconnected but restricted reality that humans find themselves in, with the strands representing the unseen barriers that keep us in place. Even in contemporary times, stories of UFO sightings and alien abductions often contain themes of control, manipulation and containment. These modern myths might reflect a subconscious awareness of our confinement expressed through the lens of science fiction and popular culture. The recurring theme of confinement, control and restriction across various myths and legends worldwide might be more than mere coincidence. These stories could be echoes of a profound truth hidden in our collective unconscious, pointing towards our existence within a controlled and confined space. The Fermi Paradox presents one of the most intriguing questions in the field of astrobiology, with an estimated 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each containing billions of stars and even more planets, why haven't we detected any signs of extraterrestrial intelligence? Could this apparent silence in the cosmos be related to the idea that Earth is an alien prison, and if so, how? One explanation for this paradox is the concept of the Great Filter, a hypothetical barrier that prevents civilizations from reaching a certain level of technological advancement could this barrier be part of a containment strategy to isolate intelligent species, including humans, from each other? Another intriguing explanation is the zoo hypothesis, suggesting that extraterrestrial civilizations are deliberately avoiding contact with us. This could align with the Earth as a prison theory, where alien overseers maintain our isolation to prevent us from interfering with other parts of the cosmic prison system. The possibility that advanced civilizations inevitably self-destruct before reaching a level of technological maturity to explore the cosmos is a somber explanation for the Fermi Paradox. 
If Earth is a prison, this self-destruction could be a designed outcome, ensuring that inmates never advance enough to escape or pose a threat. Our inability to detect extraterrestrial signals might also be a matter of technology. If alien civilizations use advanced communication methods beyond our comprehension, we wouldn't be able to detect them. In the context of the prison hypothesis, this could be a security measure to keep the communication of the jailers beyond the understanding of the prisoners. Some proponents of the Earth as a prison theory take the argument a step further by suggesting that the entire observable universe is designed in such a way to make us believe we are alone. This crafted illusion could be part of a complex containment strategy, reinforcing our isolation. What if the next frontier for imprisonment wasn't just a maximum security facility somewhere in the remote mountains, but far beyond our Earth, in the vastness of space? Today we are delving into, what if humans made a secret prison in space? We'll explore the utopian society that could necessitate it, the practicality of human versus cryogenic incarceration, and ponder over the eternal debate. Should this high security fortress in the cosmos be manned by human guards or be completely automated? So what do we mean by a utopian society? In this hypothetical future, we've seen extraordinary advances in science, education and technology that create a positive feedback loop with societal structures. People are more educated, which leads to better decision-making and a stronger social fabric. That, in turn, reduces crime because an educated populace tends to be a more ethical populace. Crime is basically a social construct, right? It emerges in contexts where there are significant disparities in resources, education or social justice. Address these core issues and crime rates plummet. Imagine technology so advanced that it could intervene before a crime happens. Not in a creepy surveillance state way, but more in the vein of identifying societal stresses and neutralizing them. Perhaps emotional and mental well-being could be so well understood that preemptive care becomes the norm. The utopian society of this scenario doesn't just throw money and tech at problems, it's also philosophically and ethically advanced. The value systems, moral codes and even religions have likely evolved to be more inclusive, more forgiving and less dogmatic. This is a society that understands the complexities of human behavior and deals with them in a sophisticated manner. But here's where things get a bit paradoxical. If you've managed to cultivate such a perfectly trust-based society, the very existence of a prison system would disrupt that trust, even if there is only a minuscule percentage of people who commit crimes. The notion that there is a place where people are forcibly confined could cast a shadow over the utopian dream. So what's the solution? Perhaps the answer lies not on Earth, but beyond it. And that's where the idea of a secret space prison comes in. But more on that later. The utopia hypothesis challenges us to consider how far we are willing to go to achieve a perfect society and what sacrifices, ethical or otherwise, we are prepared to make. It also prompts us to think critically about whether a utopian society is even attainable or whether it's a no place, an ideal that can guide us but never be fully realized. Fascinating, isn't it? But let's not stop there. What happens to those who simply don't fit into this idyllic world? Let's find out. All right, let's dive right in. If we've hypothetically crafted this near-perfect society on Earth, one that has effectively eradicated most forms of crime and social discord, why would we even need a prison? Well, here's where things get particularly interesting. Even in a utopian society, one of the great constants is human variability. Not everyone's neural circuits are wired the same way. And while most may adapt to a system of ethical and social norms, some might not. Think of it like a Gaussian distribution, or what you might recognize as a bell curve. In any large population, there will be outliers, individuals who, for a myriad of reasons, do not conform to societal norms. What do we do with these outliers in a society that is fundamentally based on trust and ethical consistency? Sending them to a conventional prison on Earth could challenge the foundational ideas of the utopia. It introduces an element of coercion and force that is contradictory to the society's principles. The very idea that you could be imprisoned could create an underlying tension, a ripple in the calm waters of the utopian dream. So, why not take the prison out of the equation, or rather, out of Earth's gravitational pull? Welcome to the concept of a space prison. By placing the prison in space, 
you're removing the physicality of the problem from the earth and perhaps symbolically you're also keeping the purity of the utopian dream intact. In this scenario, earth remains a sanctuary of enlightened human cooperation, while the inevitable outliers are placed far from its surface. Now, you might argue that launching people into space is, well, astronomically expensive. Yes, but in a society that has advanced to this level, it's possible that space travel has also been revolutionized. Maybe it's as routine as catching a flight from New York to London. Or maybe the resource allocation is so efficient that society can easily afford it. And let's talk about oversight. Who watches the watchmen? Especially when the watchmen are light years away, it's a complex ethical and logistical question. Would the space prison be entirely automated? Would it be governed by a subset of Earth's laws? Or would it have its own set of rules adapted for the unique situation? You see, the idea of a space prison isn't just about the how, but also the why. It's an exploration into the outer reaches of human ethics and governance. How do you balance justice and freedom? How do you reconcile the inevitable imperfections within a nearly perfect society? So you're probably wondering, would these space-bound individuals be kept frozen? Or would they be conscious? And who or what would manage such a prison? Well, let's get into that. Ah, yes, the age-old debate of the science fiction world has now, in our hypothetical scenario, become a pressing ethical and logistical question. Should the inmates of our space prison be awake, living out their sentences, or should they be frozen in a state of cryogenic suspension? It sounds like something out of a dystopian novel, but bear with me here. First, let's tackle the idea of human incarceration. Now, if we're sending humans to live in a prison in space, the cost of sustaining life becomes an important factor. We're talking about life support systems, food, water, and waste management. In the vacuum of space, every ounce of oxygen counts. Then there's the issue of mental health. Imagine being confined not just within walls, but within the limits of a spacecraft, far away from Earth. That's social isolation to an extreme level. Would our society, as advanced as it is, be okay with this form of psychological toll? And what about rebellion? If the prison were to have human guards, there's always the chance of a mutiny. Even automated systems could potentially be overridden. It's a risk factor that can't be completely eradicated, so long as the prisoners are conscious and capable of action. Now let's consider cryogenic incarceration. On the surface, it seems like an ideal solution. Freezing an individual in a state of suspended animation could significantly reduce the resource cost. No need for food, water or even oxygen in the traditional sense. A fully automated system could monitor the inmates, reducing the need for human oversight. This would also eliminate the risk of rebellion or escape attempts, assuming, of course, that the cryogenic process is foolproof. However, freezing a human for an extended period brings its own set of ethical dilemmas. What if the technology fails and the person never wakes up? Is that ethical? Furthermore, what happens when they are eventually unfrozen? If our society has advanced, will they be able to reintegrate? Or will they be a person out of time struggling to catch up with the world that has long since moved on without them? It also begs the question of the purpose of incarceration. Is it punitive, rehabilitative or purely segregative? If it's punitive or rehabilitative, cryogenic freezing might not achieve that goal as the individual is essentially paused rather than experiencing a sentence. Each option, human versus cryogenic incarceration, has its own set of pros and cons, both logistical and ethical. And this is where the concept of a space prison gets tangled in a web of moral and practical complexities. So now that we've considered why a space prison might be necessary and how it might function, who or what would be in charge of this off-world facility? Let's dig deeper into that. And now we arrive at an important fork in the road. Should this space prison of the future be manned by human guards or should it be completely automated? It's a question that pulls at the boundaries between human intuition and machine efficiency. This is not just a logistical issue, but also one that touches on ethics, psychology, and even the philosophy of what constitutes justice and humane treatment. Let's begin with human guards. The first advantage is experience. Human guards can make judgment calls based on a wide range of emotional and environmental factors that current technology can't perceive. If a fight breaks out between inmates, or if someone appears to be in distress, a human guard can use intuition and situational awareness to make complex decisions. 
Plus, the human touch, as it were, might make incarceration a less dehumanizing experience, potentially aiding in the rehabilitation process. However, humans are fallible. They can be biased, they can make mistakes, and they themselves would be isolated from Earth, creating a potential risk for mental health issues. They also require all the life-sustaining resources we discussed earlier – food, water, oxygen, and so on. Plus, in the isolation and potential monotony of space, the temptation for corruption or negligence might increase. So what about complete automation? Imagine a prison overseen by an AI warden and maintained by robotic guards. These machines would not need life support, they wouldn't get tired, bored, or corrupt, and they could potentially manage resources more efficiently. With advances in machine learning, an AI could adapt to the needs of the prison, even predicting conflicts before they happen based on inmate behavior data. Sounds ideal. Well, not so fast. Automating a prison system takes the human element out of a very human-centric process. Justice. Machines do not have a moral compass, and even the most advanced AI is not conscious and therefore cannot make ethical judgments. There's also the concern about malfunctions or hacking. Imagine a rogue agent taking control of the entire prison system and its robotic guards. The consequences could be disastrous. Another factor to consider is the justice system itself. An automated prison might streamline the sentencing process, possibly making it more rigid and less prone to human error or bias. But is justice that's 100% by the book always the most fair or ethical? In the balance between human and machine, the debate over who should oversee a space prison is as complex as it is fascinating. Each option opens a Pandora's box of logistical challenges and ethical quandaries. So, we've explored the idea of a space prison, considered why it might be necessary, how we might keep inmates either awake or frozen, and who might guard this high-tech Alcatraz in the sky. But now let's ask ourselves, could society accept the ethical burden of such a place? Prisons. We think of them as a modern institution, a way of punishing those who break society's rules. But did you know our ancestors also had their versions of incarceration? From Rome to Persia, from England to ancient Maya, history is filled with examples of humanity's attempts to deter and punish crime. But these weren't prisons as we know them. Let's take a journey back in time to some of the most brutal and fascinating prisons in history. How did they treat their inmates? What weird and fearsome rituals did they perform? Buckle up because we're about to delve deep into humanity's past to uncover the dark underbelly of ancient societies. The heart of ancient Rome gives us our first destination, the dreaded Mamertine prison. This centuries-old edifice, steeped in tales of brutality, provides a gruesome glimpse into how the mighty Roman Empire dealt with its enemies. You see, the Romans were no strangers to discipline, order and, yes, punishment. One thing that stands out about the Mamertine prison is its structure, or rather, lack thereof. This wasn't a prison with bars, cells and guards, instead it was more like a dark, dank pit hollowed out directly from the Earth's crust. It was located at the base of Capitoline Hill, primarily underground, and was more of a dungeon than a prison as we know it. It was said to have two gloomy, damp chambers, one atop the other. Prisoners were first placed in the upper chamber known as the Tullianum. This chamber was around 12 feet high and 30 feet wide and deep, and could accommodate a considerable number of prisoners. However, the place was a far cry from comfort, it had a single opening at the top through which prisoners were lowered into the darkness using a rope or a chain. But the real horror was the lower chamber. At this was where prisoners who were sentenced to die were sent. In stark contrast to the Tullianum, this room was smaller, darker and suffocatingly close, known for its inhumane conditions. Historical records, some as old as 22 centuries, suggest that the Mamertine prison was often used to contain high-profile prisoners, enemies of the state. One notable inmate was said to be Saint Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, who was allegedly incarcerated here before his execution. But it was not just the physical torment that made the Mamertine prison infamous. The psychological terror of being in such a place, the oppressive darkness, the dreadful anticipation of passing, and the agonizing wait for execution. These were perhaps even more tormenting than the actual physical conditions of the prison. Indeed, the Mamertine prison serves as a chilling reminder of Rome's darker side, a testament to the empire's harsh, often brutal system of justice. 
Let's travel further east to the ancient city of Xanthos, located in what is now modern-day Turkey but was then part of the Persian Empire. Here the prison was not a building or even a complex, but a singular macabre artifact, the wooden horse of Xanthos. This wooden contraption, known in ancient texts as the horse, was a chilling form of both punishment and imprisonment, showcasing the truly inventive if not horrific forms of incarceration in the ancient world. Designed with a hollow interior, the horse served as a grotesque echo of the famous Trojan horse. However, this was not a vessel of soldiers, but a container for pain and suffering. Prisoners were placed within the horse, their bodies contorted to fit the cramped interior. Once inside, they were at the mercy of the elements with the scorching sun during the day and freezing cold at night. But the horror of the wooden horse did not stop there. It was raised high above the ground meaning that once a prisoner was inside, escape was nearly impossible. The public humiliation, the physical discomfort, and the psychological torture of being trapped within this wooden monstrosity all contributed to making the horse a truly terrifying form of punishment. Moreover, the wooden horse was not used for long-term incarceration. Instead, it was an end-of-life sentence. Prisoners placed inside the horse rarely survived the ordeal as the grueling conditions led to exhaustion, dehydration, and eventually their untimely passing. The wooden horse of Xanthos serves as a chilling reminder of the inventive and brutal forms of punishment humanity can devise. Journeying a bit northwards, we find ourselves in the heart of London, England. It is here that one of the oldest and most notorious prisons of ancient Europe stood, the Bridewell Prison. Established in the 16th century, the Bridewell was initially intended as a palace for Henry V. However, its destiny was to become something far more sinister, transforming into a house of correction. A penitentiary for the city's beggars, vagrants and petty criminals. The building was impressive, boasting over 100 rooms and a grand courtyard, but the grandeur of the palace was a stark contrast to the harsh reality of life within its walls. Inside the Bridewell, prisoners endured a unique form of correction, one that focused on reformation over punishment. Inmates of Bridewell were made to work. Hard labor was seen as a tool of reformation, a method to correct their idle ways. The work was grueling. Women were often employed in beating hemp for making rope, while men were put to work on physically demanding tasks. All this under the stern and watchful eyes of the prison staff, Yet what truly made Bridewell infamous was the severity of its punishments. These were not just physical, but also public. Whipping, for instance, was a common form of punishment, typically administered at the whipping post for everyone to see. This served a dual purpose. It was a form of correction for the prisoners, but it also served as a deterrent for the onlookers, a chilling demonstration of what awaited those who stepped out of line. But life in Bridewell wasn't just about work and punishment. It also served as a refuge for the homeless and the destitute. Yes, it was a prison, but in a time when social services were virtually non-existent, it also provided shelter and a form of social security for those who had nowhere else to go. The Bridewell prison, despite its brutal reputation, provides an intriguing glimpse into the early evolution of the modern penal system. It was here that the concept of reformation through labor was first put into practice, a notion that for better or worse has been a mainstay of prisons around the world ever since. But let's not forget the Americas. Shifting our gaze across the Atlantic, we find ourselves in the heart of the ancient Mayan civilization, renowned for their advanced mathematics calendar systems and of course their brutal penal codes. Notably, we have the infamous prison of Kitala, a true testament to the harsh and fearsome world of Mayan justice. Kitala wasn't just a prison, it was an arena of punishment designed to inflict maximum suffering and disgrace. The very architecture of the prison was designed to reflect this. Deep pits, known as chultuns, were carved directly into the limestone bedrock, creating vertical prison cells from which there was no escape. But what makes Kitala so chilling is not just its physical form, but also its psychological and spiritual dimensions. The Mayans held a deep respect for the earth and believed that being buried alive was one of the worst punishments imaginable. In this light, the Chultuns of Kitala represented not just a physical incarceration, but a spiritual defilement. Conditions in Kitala were harsh, even by ancient standards. Prisoners were subjected to physical and psychological torture. They were deprived of food and water, 
left to endure the sweltering heat and tormented by the knowledge of their impending doom. There's also a grim irony to Kitala's purpose. The Mayans used chultuns as a method of water storage during the dry season, essential for their survival. Yet these same life-giving structures were also used as a tool of torment, a stark reminder of the dual nature of human innovation. The chilling echo of Kitala still resonates today. It's a stark reminder of the brutality of the ancient world. And here's something you might not have expected. Ancient Egypt, a civilization that has fascinated us for millennia, has left behind traces of an infamous detention system in Elephantine Island. This is a place where prisoners were not just physically confined, but also psychologically tortured. Elephantine Island, located in the Nile, was the site of a unique prison system in ancient Egypt. Its isolation made it an ideal place for incarceration. Prisoners were ferried to the island and left there, isolated from society and surrounded by the unforgiving Nile. But the imprisonment didn't just involve physical isolation. Ancient Egyptian society was deeply spiritual with a profound belief in the afterlife. They believed that in order to reach the afterlife, a person's body had to be preserved and so mummification was common practice. Here comes the chilling part. To instill fear and punishment, it's said that the prison guards on Elephantine Island would threaten to throw the bodies of dead prisoners into the Nile. The idea of their bodies being lost and destroyed, denying them access to the afterlife, was a terrifying prospect for these ancient people, making their imprisonment not just a physical but a deeply spiritual punishment. Records of Elephantine Island also suggest harsh living conditions. The prisoners were put to hard labor, forced to quarry stone and load boats under the scorching Egyptian sun. Food and water were scarce and the hot, dry air made life incredibly difficult. So there we have it, a journey into the brutal realities of ancient incarceration. From the suffocating Mamatine prison to the psychologically terrifying Elephantine Island prison, We've seen how prisons were not just physical institutions, but psychological ones as well. These harrowing tales of punishment and survival give us a fresh perspective on the societies that we so often romanticize. As much as we marvel at the architectural splendors of Rome, the scientific wonders of Persia, the cultural richness of England and the spiritual depth of the Maya and Egyptians, we should remember that these civilizations like ours had a darker side. Thanks for joining me on this journey, and remember, the annals of history hold many more such intriguing and sometimes terrifying stories. Today, we're taking a deep dive into a futuristic world of punishment, one that's only existed within the bounds of creative cinema until now. Imagine a world where prisons aren't just about bars, guards, and isolation cells. What if instead they existed on floating ships, within our dreams, or even on distant planets? In this exploration, we will delve into the thrilling yet ethically challenging concept of future prisons, inspired by cinematic masterpieces such as Escape Plan, Minority Report, Inception, and more. From the chilling isolation of a cryogenic cell to the boundless, intangible prison of the mind, we're going to unravel what the future of incarceration could look like. All right, let's dive into the concept of floating prisons as depicted in the movie Escape Plan. The prison, known as the tomb, is housed within an enormous ship, hidden from the world and ever on the move. It's a fascinating concept, isn't it? The idea that we could create a prison that is always shifting location, traversing international waters, making it not only a tough place to escape from, but also a hard place to locate. Imagine the mechanics of it. An advanced navigation system ensuring that the prison remains in international waters, away from jurisdictions, always on the move to deter escape plans. Prisoners wouldn't just need to worry about breaching walls or fences, but they would need to consider survival in open waters, contend with currents, and reckon with vast distances to any shore. It would be a prison escape turned survivalist expedition, daunting to say the least. Furthermore, the structure of the prison could be designed for rapid response, with sections that can be sealed off in case of a riot or an escape attempt. This kind of advanced section design would make it even harder for prisoners to navigate their way out, especially when paired with high-tech surveillance and security systems. But the questions this concept raises go beyond the logistical. What about the human rights of prisoners in such a facility? The psychological effects of confinement in a place constantly adrift, 
the challenges of regulation and oversight when the prison is not bound by the usual geographical and jurisdictional constraints, uh, these would all need to be addressed. It is an intriguing thought experiment. Would a seaborne prison be the ultimate answer to escape-proof confinement? Or would it rather open a Pandora's box of legal, ethical and humanitarian issues? Escape Plan presents a provocative vision of a possible future, but it is one that we would need to navigate with extreme care. So now let's take a look at the idea of a virtual prison, a concept depicted in the movie Minority Report. In this film, a sophisticated system known as pre-crime can predict crimes before they happen, and the so-called criminals are put into a dreamlike state for their sentence. But this isn't a pleasant dream. It's a psychological limbo that seems to stretch on endlessly. The technology used in the film, a neural interface, directly interacts with the prisoner's brain, creating a state of suspended animation while life outside continues. This virtual prison could, in theory, allow society to manage convicts without the need for physical prisons or resources. The individuals serving their sentences would be kept alive, but not conscious or capable of causing harm. But then, the ethics of this form of punishment become murkier the deeper you delve. Yes, it's efficient. But is it humane? Although the prisoners in Minority Report are not aware of the passing of time, they're trapped within their own minds in a state that is eerily close to a coma. Is it right to put a person into such a state, essentially erasing their existence from the world for the duration of their sentence? Also, it opens the door for misuse of power. The entire justice system hinges on the assumption that the pre-crime predictions are accurate. But what if they're not? A person could be wrongfully imprisoned based on a crime they haven't committed yet. This concept brings forth a multitude of ethical and moral questions, questions that society would need to answer before such a method could even be considered. Virtual prisons, as imagined in Minority Report, present a stark vision of a possible future, where justice is as much a product of our technological capabilities as it is a concept of moral right and wrong. From virtual prisons, we now dive into another concept that has captured the imagination of many science fiction enthusiasts, cryo-prisons. The movie Demolition Man explores this futuristic idea. Picture this. Instead of serving time in a conventional prison, criminals are frozen for the duration of their sentence. Let's dive into that chilly prospect. The concept, in theory, seems almost elegant in its simplicity. Cryo-prisons would preserve the prisoner in a state of suspended animation their biological functions slow to an absolute crawl, placing them in a deep freeze. During this time, they neither age nor are they conscious, essentially placing them in a time-out from society until their sentence is complete. But how plausible is this, really? Cryogenics is an existing field of study, but its current applications are far from the science fiction world of Demolition Man. At this point in time, we are able to cryogenically preserve individual cells and small tissues, but a whole human being. That's a different story entirely. Current science can't successfully freeze and thaw a human without causing serious cellular damage, particularly from ice crystals that form and can puncture cells. But let's say, hypothetically in the future, we do overcome these hurdles. A new host of ethical considerations then come into play. If the frozen person is not conscious, are they serving a sentence or just waiting it out? What happens to their mind while their body is frozen? In Demolition Man, prisoners are subjected to subconscious rehabilitation programming to reform them. But would this be ethical? Could it even work? And then there's the social impact to consider. Releasing a prisoner who hasn't aged a day into a world that's moved on without them could be a recipe for societal disruption and personal disorientation. Cryoprisons, like the one shown in Demolition Man, are a fascinating thought experiment pushing the boundaries of our current understanding of both science and ethics in criminal justice. Digital prisons. If you're a fan of thought-provoking and often disturbing television, you might be familiar with Black Mirror. In one particularly memorable episode, White Christmas, the show introduces a concept of a digital prison that traps a copy of a person's consciousness, not their physical body. Digital prisons could work like this. A perfect copy of a prisoner's consciousness, known as a cookie in the show, is extracted and placed in a virtual prison environment. 
This simulation is controlled to the minutest detail, including the flow of time. This means that a prisoner could serve years, even centuries in this virtual hell, while only seconds pass in the real world. The concept on the surface is chillingly efficient. It seems like a way to completely neutralize threats without the costs and complications of physical incarceration. But when we dig deeper, things get complicated and ethically murky. For starters, the technology to create an exact copy of a person's consciousness doesn't currently exist. It's all purely speculative. Our understanding of consciousness and how it originates from the brain is still in its infancy. But for the sake of argument, let's imagine such a technology is developed. The implications are staggering and deeply troubling. Imagine being sentenced to hundreds of years of solitary confinement in mere moments. It's a psychological torture beyond what we can comprehend. In the Black Mirror episode, a prisoner is left alone in a cabin, isolated and tormented for what seems to him like thousands of years, while only a few seconds pass outside. It's a horrifying form of punishment, almost medieval in its cruelty, and raises serious questions about human rights and the principle of proportional punishment. And then there's the question of whether punishing a copy of a person's consciousness equates to punishing the person themselves. If the real person is free in the physical world, while their cookie suffers, who are we really punishing? Like many Black Mirror episodes, the concept of digital prisons poses unsettling questions about technology, punishment, and our sense of self. It forces us to grapple with what it means to be human in a world where our very consciousness might be replicated and manipulated. Diving into the realm of cosmic punishment, our next stop takes us into the far reaches of the galaxy. If you're a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you may be familiar with The Kiln from Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a high-security prison situated on a desolate planet, housing some of the universe's most dangerous criminals. The idea of off-planet incarceration is a fascinating one, so let's go ahead and see what it would entail. Imagine a prison not limited by earthly concerns, one where there's virtually unlimited room for expansion, and the security is provided by the inhospitable environment of outer space itself. Sounds like the perfect solution to crime, right? But just as we have seen with other concepts, the devil is in the details. First, the costs and logistical challenges of setting up and maintaining a prison in space are astronomical, quite literally. You'd need to transport prisoners there, provide life-sustaining resources like air and food, deal with waste management, and more. Currently, it costs around $10,000 to put a pound of anything into orbit. Sending a human, let alone thousands of them, plus all the necessary equipment and supplies to another planet, would be a colossal financial undertaking. Moreover, we must consider the isolation factor. A prison planet like the Kiln would be virtually impossible to escape from but it would also be far removed from any chance of rehabilitation or reintegration into society. What happens when a sentence is over? How does one reintegrate into society when they've been light years away from it? Not to mention the psychological toll of being imprisoned on another planet, cut off from everything and everyone you know, could be incredibly damaging. The feeling of being removed from society can exacerbate feelings of hopelessness and desperation, leading to even more psychological problems. And just like with cryo-prisons, there's the ethical and human rights considerations. Is it humane to send a person to a prison planet, isolated and possibly doomed to live out their sentence in solitude or alongside the worst criminals in the galaxy? Like the other futuristic prison concepts, the idea of a prison planet challenges our assumptions about crime, punishment and human rights. It's a thought-provoking concept that opens the door to a universe of possibilities and potential nightmares. Continuing our journey through the landscapes of cinematic justice, let's now delve into a realm where the boundaries between reality and dreams are blurred, a prison of the mind. For this, we'll turn to Christopher Nolan's mind-bending masterpiece, Inception. In Inception, we explore the concept of dream-sharing technology, where individuals can infiltrate others' dreams and implant or steal ideas. Now imagine applying that technology to the prison system. Rather than physical bars and guards, the prisoner's mind itself becomes the confinement. They are trapped within their own dreams, their consciousness serving as both the prisoner and the jailer. One possible scenario could involve prisoners living in a dream state where they experience a normal, peaceful life. By contrast, they could also face an endless series of nightmares as part of their punishment. In either case, 
the prisoner's physical body would be in a state of suspended animation, perhaps even safely stored away. The advantage of this prison system would be the reduction of physical resources required to sustain prisoners, as well as the potential for rehabilitation. The dream state could be designed to teach prisoners empathy, social skills or other important life lessons, preparing them for eventual release. However, like all the other concepts we've discussed, this one is also riddled with ethical dilemmas and practical issues. If the prisoners are trapped within their dreams, how do we ensure they are receiving proper physical care? More importantly, what are the psychological implications of trapping a person within their mind? The concept of mental health is also crucial here. In a dream prison, an individual's psychological state becomes their reality. For someone with mental health issues, this could be a terrifying ordeal, exacerbating existing conditions or creating new ones. Furthermore, what would be the long-term effects on a person's psyche after living years or decades in a dream state? Would they be able to distinguish reality from the dream once released? And on a philosophical level, is it ethical to alter a person's reality to such an extent even as a form of punishment? The concept of a prison of the mind takes the discussion of future incarceration methods into the realm of the abstract, pushing the boundaries of how we understand punishment, reality, and the human mind. Hello everyone, today we're setting course for a journey into the future, a future that pushes the boundaries of human imagination. Have you ever considered what would happen if Earth was no longer livable? And we, as a species, had to pack up and leave. This isn't just a plot of a sci-fi novel, but a question that scientists and futurists grapple with as we explore more about our universe and our place in it. So strap yourself in as we delve into the fascinating scenario of humanity's greatest voyage, escaping Earth to settle on a new habitable world. Picture a futuristic spaceship, but not just any spaceship. This one is large enough to accommodate hundreds, if not thousands of people. It's a floating city in space, a haven for human life amidst the infinite cosmos. This is the concept of a space arc or generation ship. It's not a new concept by any means. The term generation ship was first used in science fiction literature in the mid 20th century. The idea is simple yet profound. A self-sustaining spaceship that can support human life over multiple generations, enabling the colonization of distant planets. This ship wouldn't be like the shuttles or stations we currently use for space exploration. It would need to replicate the conditions on Earth as closely as possible. The ship's design might include large rotating cylinders to create artificial gravity, a concept proposed by physicist Gerard K. O'Neill. Picture immense green spaces for agriculture and relaxation, housing structures, schools, hospitals, and everything else you would find in a city back on Earth. This would be a moving microcosm of our planet, a fully functional society in space. Imagine, too, the wide windows of the ship that look out onto the star-speckled blackness, where children born on board would marvel at the swirling galaxies passing by, an ever-changing spectacle far surpassing any earthly landscape. This isn't mere speculation. Some scientists believe that such a ship could be our best hope for reaching habitable planets beyond our solar system, planets that would otherwise take thousands of years to reach with our current propulsion technology. So what might propel such a ship, and what might life be like aboard this gigantic vessel? Let's delve into the possibilities. Getting from Earth to a distant exoplanet is no easy task. With our current technology, it would take tens of thousands of years to reach even the closest potentially habitable planet. Clearly, if our survival as a species depended on making such a journey, we would need a much faster method of travel. But what could that look like? Well, many different propulsion methods have been proposed for interstellar travel. One such proposal involves ion drives, a type of engine that expels ions to create thrust. While they provide a slow initial acceleration, Ion drives are incredibly efficient and can reach much higher speeds than traditional chemical rockets over long distances. Another promising candidate is the concept of a nuclear propulsion system. One variant of this, known as Project Orion, proposed the idea of propelling a ship using a series of nuclear explosions. However, the inherent risks and potential for catastrophic failure have kept such concepts mostly confined to the drawing board. Yet another exciting concept comes straight out of the world of science fiction, the warp drive. 
While it still remains firmly in the realm of theory, some physicists have suggested that it might be possible to bend space-time in such a way that a ship could jump across vast distances almost instantaneously. Regardless of the method, the propulsion system of our hypothetical space arc would need to be incredibly efficient, reliable, and capable of sustaining a voyage that could potentially last hundreds or even thousands of years. But assuming we've got our ship moving, what would life be like for the generations of humans born and raised aboard the space arc? Let's imagine. So, we've built our spaceship, we've propelled it out of Earth's atmosphere, and now we're on our way to a new world. But what happens next? What would life on board this space arc look like? First, we need to consider that this is no ordinary journey. The trip could potentially take multiple generations to complete, meaning that some of those on board would be born, live and die without ever setting foot on a planet. This would necessitate a complete rethinking of our societal structures and norms. The spaceship would essentially be a self-contained world, needing to recycle and renew its resources constantly to sustain life. That means every inch of the ship would have to be designed with efficiency in mind. Uh, hydroponic farms could produce food, water could be recycled, and energy could be generated from the nuclear propulsion system, or perhaps through a Dyson sphere if we're getting ambitious. Life would also need to be structured to combat the psychological challenges of living in confined spaces for extended periods. There would need to be ample recreational facilities and programs to promote mental well-being. Education would also be crucial as each generation would need to learn the skills necessary to maintain the ship and its systems, but it wouldn't all be about survival. The ship could also have digital archives containing the collective knowledge and culture of humanity, so even as new generations grow and develop in the confines of their space-born home, they would still be connected to their roots on Earth. All of this points to a dramatic shift in the way humans live and interact. With a population confined to a single vessel for multiple generations, society on board our space arc would likely evolve in ways that we can barely imagine. So we've designed our spaceship, equipped it with cutting-edge propulsion and planned for a sustainable life on board. But how would this drastic change in lifestyle affect our society and our way of life? Well, living on a generation spaceship is likely to result in significant societal changes. With the entire population confined to a single vessel, our existing structures of countries and borders would become obsolete. Instead, the ship might be divided into zones or departments, each with its own function and responsibilities creating a new sort of division and social structure. With finite resources, the concept of economy would also need to be drastically reimagined. Instead of wealth being defined by money or material possessions, it might be determined by access to certain privileges, or based on one's contribution to the ship's operations and maintenance. Our governance systems would also likely evolve. In such a contained environment, every action has a direct impact on the community, making cooperation and consensus building paramount. We might see new forms of democracy emerge, optimized for the specific challenges of spaceborne society. Furthermore, the fixed population aboard the spaceship would require strict population control measures. Family units and relationships could transform, and new norms and cultural practices might evolve in response to these unique circumstances. Also, the psychological impact of living in a completely human-constructed environment, isolated from the natural world, could prompt a shift in our cultural and artistic expression. Spaceborne generations might develop new forms of art and music, drawing inspiration from their unique experiences and environment. Finally, the shared mission of survival and the constant reminder of our fragile existence could foster a profound sense of unity and shared purpose among the ship's inhabitants. On this journey, humanity might finally become truly global, in a sense far deeper than anything we've experienced before. And all of this begs the question, would we still be the same humans who once lived on Earth, or would this new lifestyle create something entirely new? A new way of being, a new definition of human. Now let's imagine, generations have passed and our spaceship finally approaches its destination. A potentially habitable planet, a distant promise turned into reality. How would we go about settling on a completely alien world? The initial task would be to survey the new world, using a combination of sophisticated onboard instruments and drones to assess its viability for human habitation. These would examine the planet's atmospheric composition, 
gravity, temperature, presence of water, and any potential biological life forms. But even after the green light is given, there is the daunting task of setting foot on a completely new world. The first settlers, most likely a group of highly trained specialists, would need to construct an initial base, possibly using resources harvested from the new world itself. This could involve in-situ resource utilization technologies, such as 3D printing habitats using local materials, or establishing hydroponic systems for agriculture. Settling a new planet might also mean dealing with an environment significantly different from Earth's. The planet's gravity might be stronger or weaker, the days and years might be longer or shorter, the climate harsher. Human bodies evolved over millions of years for life on Earth might have to adapt to these new conditions, possibly leading to physical changes over generations. Once a stable base is established, the remaining population could gradually descend from the spaceship to populate the new world. As the settlers spread out, they may even form distinct communities, each adapting to their particular environment in unique ways. Culturally, the settlers may carry forward traditions from the ship, but also develop new ones influenced by their novel surroundings. A new chapter of human history would thus begin with its roots in the spaceship that carried its ancestors across the interstellar void. And as our new home fills with the hustle and bustle of human activity, we'd look back at the empty spaceship, the cradle of several generations, a silent witness to the incredible journey that took humanity from a distant blue dot to this strange new world. Well, there we have it, an epic journey across generations and the cosmos, aboard a spaceship built as humanity's last hope. This may sound like science fiction today, but who knows? As our knowledge and technology continue to expand, such a future could be within our reach. We've seen how our spaceship might be designed, how life would be on board, and the societal changes that might occur. Then, finally, the arrival, a new home, an alien world turned into a human habitat. It's a sobering, or inspiring thought of what our future could hold. And as always, thanks for watching and keep pondering these fascinating possibilities because curiosity fuels our journey, both on Earth and beyond. Imagine a ship once robust and filled with life, now drifting aimlessly, uninhabited and silent through the vast icy expanses of the North Atlantic or resting in an eternal slumber on a foreign shoreline. The image is unsettling, isn't it? It's a stark reminder of our mortality and the inevitable march of time. Today we delve into the eerie world of abandoned ships, ghostly giants of the sea whose stories continue to captivate and mystify us. Welcome to a voyage into the unknown, as we explore the chilling tales of the MV Lubov Orlova and the SS American Star. Have you ever thought about the life of a ship after it's decommissioned? Well, some vessels lead a pretty interesting afterlife, like the MV Lubov Orlova, this colossal 300-foot cruise ship, named after the famous Soviet actress Lyubov Petrovna Orlova, was built in Yugoslavia in 1976. It was a magnificent vessel designed to explore the polar regions. But as we're about to see, the ice-cold seas would ultimately become its chilling resting place. The Lyubov Orlova was seized in 2010 in Newfoundland, Canada, due to a debt dispute. After being docked for two years, it was sold to a Dominican buyer for scrap in 2012. However, while being towed to the Dominican Republic, the tow line snapped in heavy seas, and the ship began drifting eastward into international waters. From then, the Lyubov Orlova became known as the Ghost Ship of the Arctic. Despite repeated attempts to secure the ship, it proved elusive. Powered only by currents and winds, this ghost ship roamed the seas, its exact whereabouts often unknown. There were rumors and reports suggesting that the ship may have finally sunk, but without firm evidence, its fate remained a maritime mystery. As for exploration, it's not just about the thrill of discovery. Safety is paramount, and the Lyubov Orlova, abandoned for years and battered by the elements, presented too many risks. Its interior spaces would have deteriorated significantly, and structural integrity would be questionable at best. There's also the consideration of legal rights to a vessel adrift in international waters. Besides, there's a much creepier aspect to consider. The ship was rumored to be infested with cannibal rats. Yes, you heard that right. Left without a food source, the rats aboard would have turned to cannibalism. It's a frightening thought, a ship full of potentially diseased cannibal rats roaming the high seas. Despite the creepy fascination and mystery surrounding it, 
The MV Lyubov Orlova remains a chilling reminder of the unpredictable forces of nature and the ghostly afterlife that some ships can lead once they've outlived their intended purpose. We may never know what really happened to it and maybe that's for the best. After all, who's ready to tackle a potential rat-infested ghost ship? If you thought that was it for the Lyubov Orlova, well, the plot thickens, my friends. After disappearing into the fog, the fate of this ghost ship was a mystery that stirred up the imagination of many and resulted in several chilling theories and reported sightings. In January 2013, the ship was spotted 250 nautical miles off the coast of Ireland by the Atlantic Hawk, an offshore supply ship under contract to Husky Energy. The crew managed to secure it with a tow line, but authorities soon ordered them to release it, citing the lack of danger to offshore oil installations or shipping traffic. So, once again, the Lyubov Orlova was left to drift aimlessly. Rumors started to circulate about its location. Sightings were reported, though unconfirmed, some as far off as the coasts of Scotland and Norway. People began to speculate about it reaching the shores of Ireland or the United Kingdom, fueled by satellite images in 2013 suggesting a large object was drifting towards the UK. One of the most chilling theories was that the ship, adrift and abandoned, could be on a collision course with the oil rigs in the North Sea. Can you imagine an unmanned, dilapidated ship of this size causing a catastrophe on an oil rig? A true maritime horror story. And then there were those cannibal rats. The thought of a ship teeming with such desperate creatures stirred the imagination and was stuff for nightmares, let alone the disease threat they could potentially carry if the ship ever made landfall. As for exploration, despite the allure of a ghost ship shrouded in mystery, it remained unexplored due to the considerable risks involved. Its structural instability, unpredictable location, and the potential rat infestation made it a less than desirable candidate for a safe exploration. But here's where the story takes an eerie turn. The Lyubov Orlova suddenly stopped transmitting its location signal in March 2013. From that point on, it vanished without a trace. Many experts now believe that it probably sank, put to rest in the deep, dark depths of the Atlantic Ocean. But without concrete proof, the true fate of this ghost ship remains as elusive as its last known journey. The MV Lyubov Orlova's story serves as a haunting reminder of what happens when man-made structures are left to the mercy of nature's elements, evolving from a symbol of human achievement to a phantom adrift in the vastness of the ocean, its tail etched in the annals of maritime lore. Imagine a ship, an ocean liner no less, one that once gleamed with the promise of opulence and grand voyages, now reduced to a skeletal wreckage. We're taking a leap across the Atlantic, to a beach off the coast of Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands, to find our next shipwreck, the SS American Star. Originally launched in 1939 as SS America, this ship had quite an illustrious career. In its heyday, the SS American Star was a symbol of elegance and a testament to the grand era of ocean liners. But what makes the American Star so captivating is not the voyages it undertook, but rather its final resting place. In 1993, the ship was being towed from Greece to Thailand to be converted into a floating hotel when a thunderstorm severed the tow lines, casting the ship adrift. For 48 hours, it was battered by stormy seas until it ran aground off the west coast of Fuerteventura. The ship, once a beacon of luxury, was left stranded, half-submerged and at the mercy of the elements, slowly disintegrating under the relentless assault of waves and time. What remains today is just a haunting ghost of its former self. It's a sight that's both beautiful and sad, a stark contrast to the picturesque beaches of the Canary Islands. A shipwreck on a beach, well within reach of the shore, might seem like an explorer's dream, right? Not quite. Although the SS American Star is visible from the shore, exploring it is a different ballgame. It's a dangerous endeavor, one filled with unexpected hazards. The ship has been subject to intense coastal erosion. Salt water, waves and wind have worn down its structures, rendering the ship extremely unstable. Over the years, sections of the ship have collapsed, vanishing beneath the waves. By 2007, the ship had broken in two with the stern section completely submerged. What's more, the local currents and the surf are incredibly powerful and unpredictable, posing a serious risk for any who dare to approach the wreckage. Although the site has attracted its fair share of adventurous souls over the years, it's strongly discouraged due to these dangers. But the power of the SS American Star story lies not in its exploration, but in its visible decay. 
it serves as a sobering spectacle, a lesson in the relentless power of nature. From the shore, onlookers can witness the ship's transformation from a once proud ocean liner into a symbol of entropy, its silhouette slowly fading with each passing day. An eerie monument to the passage of time. There's something hauntingly beautiful about the American star. Its decaying remains, jutting out from the surf, paint a poignant picture of a bygone era, etching its ghostly outline onto the canvas of maritime history. But more than that, the ship serves as a tangible reminder of our transience in the face of nature's relentless force. But what happened after the SS American Star ran aground? Did the elements eventually consume the once proud ship? Well, much like the city of Venice, the SS American Star found itself in a battle against time and tide, in a slow, inevitable descent into the sea. After the shipwreck in 1994, the ship became a bizarre tourist attraction, visible from the shores of Fuerteventura. Tourists would flock to the beach to catch a glimpse of the ship's silhouette against the horizon, and more daring adventurers would kayak out to the wreck for a closer look. However, the SS American Star was not just an object of fascination for humans, it also became a haven for various forms of marine life. Coral began to grow on its hull, attracting a variety of fish, and over the years the shipwreck slowly transformed into a makeshift artificial reef. As strange as it might sound, even in its derelict state, the SS American Star found a way to contribute to life. However, the harsh conditions of the Atlantic were relentless. The battering of the waves, the corrosive salt water, the gusty winds, all of these factors began to take their toll on the ship. In 2007, barely a decade after it had run aground, the ship broke in half due to the constant onslaught of the elements, and by 2013, the majority of the ship had sunk beneath the waves, disappearing from the sight of the beachgoers who had been drawn to its eerie beauty. Today, almost nothing of the SS American Star remains visible above water. The once majestic ship is now a hidden underwater relic, visited only by intrepid divers and its non-human inhabitants. Its final resting place serves as a haunting reminder of the ship's once illustrious history and a testament to the relentless power of nature. It's a story that continues to captivate, even as the ship itself fades away, slowly being reclaimed by the sea from which it once emerged. And so, our maritime journey comes to an end. We've navigated the chilling tales of the MV Lyubov Orlova, the ghost ship of the North Atlantic and the SS American Star, whose remains now lie hidden beneath the waves off the coast of Fuerteventura. These hulking vessels, once brimming with life and purpose, now serve as stark reminders of our past and the relentless forces of time and nature. They captivate our imaginations, not just as tales of derelict ships, but as stories of human ambition, triumph, and ultimately, surrender to the elements. As we bid them farewell, these ghostly giants of the sea continue their silent vigil, carrying with them the echoes of bygone eras into the vast, uncharted waters of the future. As always, thanks for watching.